Veronica. Thank you, Boris, for organizing, for inviting us. It's nice to be again here in person. I wish Kevin could be here because a lot of the work which I'll be mentioning is created by Kevin King, who's joined us team recently. Uh, but I'd like to start this presentation with this image and uh, this book, um, which I think continues what uh, Jose was talking about, about the spirit of collaboration, about the fact that uh, often many things that you see is not the result of one person, but there's a community of people involved. And uh, in this project, uh, which is designed by Susana Carvalho and, and Kai Bernau, we invited uh, Tamil poet uh, Di Tishani Doshi to write a specific poem for the book, which have been translated to 150 languages and where hundreds of people were involved to make it happen. Um, and again, I think it's an illustration of what is happening daily, that uh, you know, many things are not the result of a singular person, but uh, you know, there's a team of, uh, there's a community behind it. There's a lot of language research. These pages, for example, are created by uh, research by a uh, um, researcher um, about every writing script providing information for the users because many of the writing scripts they may have different typographic traditions, preferences, and it's important to know also how to use them. Uh, essays, everything. Um, I'll have a couple of slides to, before I bridge to syllabics to explain uh, the approach to languages that we do have. Uh, this is, for example, a really typeface release that came out this week. Uh, so from a new typeface right from the start would support eight ri different writing scripts. Uh, so we would not wait to you know, introduce them gradually. Uh, we usually work either in the groups, so you would have like a you know, release for, I don't know, uh, Hebrew and would be a collection of Hebrew typefaces, or we would just focus on the design and introduce it and then slowly extend it. For example, this is an ex example of November, which has been growing over time. And a uh, wonderful thing is that we continue learning new things and go back and can revise and improve things. Uh, so it is not a static release. It becomes continuously updated as we learn these things. Uh, we work with smaller and larger languages. One of the biggest writing scripts, obviously, is Chinese. Uh, is we've been working on this for years, and it will be hopefully a one-day subject of a lecture in the future. Right now, it just shows the work in progress. Hmm? Okay, <laughs> 2023, we have a planned release for, for this. Uh, AI knowledge, everything, that's, it's an interesting one. Um, but here's a list of scripts that we've been dealing with um, until now. And um, you know, there's uh, many of them which are well documented and, and you can find resources in libraries and there are books written about them. But there are many which there's uh, much less information, which leaves us with less options to, you know, to how to find out that we, if you're doing the justice to the language. Uh, and the only way to do it is to collaborate with users. So I think this, the main theme of this talk will be about connections, about making sure that you know, we design these fonts not really for clients, we design it for people, we design it for readers. And in order to do that, uh, we have to speak to these communities, to these linguistic communities. So these are photos from a recent trip we did to Jamshedpur, uh, that's an area in the northeast of India. Uh, Santali community uh, who speak in Santali and using the writing script called Old Chiki, which is a, a wonderful writing script but, uh, and very important for the community because it allows them to claim their graphic autonomy, which is different from everything else. So it's not just linguistic autonomy uh, in the absence of geographic autonomy, but it is something which is central to the identity that they're able to express it in their script. And because there's no, you know, th there's no literature about design like this, we would do multiple field trips to the community to consult with people to make sure that, again, you know, to understand the challenges that people are facing, to speak to the teachers to see how, what kind of teaching materials we can create, they can create, uh, and creating publishing infrastructure for them to make sure that the language can strive. Uh, this is an example of a much smaller, you could say, endangered writing script. Um, we work with some others, but even the larger one, for example, Devanagari is the most common script of India. Uh, there's still plenty to research. For example, we've been designing Devanagari fonts for you know, 15 years. We still wouldn't know until recently when someone would come to us from Nepal saying, like, does your font support Nepali? Uh, we wouldn't know. We, we would tell them, it does have all the glyphs, so there's nothing missing, but it just, we don't know exactly what kind of preferences the Nepalese readers from different regions may have. 
uh, we, you can find historical information. Uh, Nepali is using Devanagari letters, but it's a separate language from Hindi. Uh, and there may be different traditions and different preferences. So it would be a good um, reason to do a research to going through the published materials from different places, different countries, different regions of India and Nepal to identify very specific different forms of numerals and letters and see how they're used. We could document it, we could find um, how they have been used in history, but that doesn't still answer you know, what are the preferred shapes today? And the only way, again, to do this would be to speak to people. So we would uh, interview 400 pe uh, subject people uh, across India and Nepal uh, in different communities, in different demographics, to understand you know, what they've been exposed to in young age, what they learned, what they recognize, what they don't recognize, um, and what are the preferences, what are the expectations for, for daily use. And only then we would be able to kind of make more informed research-based decisions in designing our fonts. So not just drawing shapes, but understanding like, uh, what people uh, find usable. And understand also that these things tend to change. You know, so they are, you know, the age of, of a reader affects you know, the, the shapes which they prefer. Uh, if you're interested in this, there are two essays on our website. One is about the history of Devanagari, which portrays why and how these differences appear to be. Uh, the other one is statistical information about current preferences, current use uh, of different languages in different regions. So uh, if you're working with Devanagari, we have a cheat sheet for you, what would make sense today to support different languages. Uh, so these are, you, know, you can again find them on the website. So this was just a little intro, and uh, the main subject uh, of it will be the syllabic projects, which, uh, as I mentioned, uh, was uh, work, collab collaborative work with community, guided and uh, organized mainly by Kevin King. And I have to be here to present it. Um, so syllabics, as you may know, is a is writing script of usually mainly used in the north of Canada. Uh, we designed, I personally designed a syllabic script uh, 10 years ago. Uh, this is Fedra Sans, uh, which I think it came to, to realize that uh, it works only for specific situation in a specific environment. But uh, this was commissioned by the Avatar Cultural Center, the Inuit Cultural Institution in Nunavut, in the north. Uh, but if you were going to create a syllabic font, uh, it would have to go far beyond this, because syllabics are used all across uh, North America. Uh, so it's, and they are very different, distinct linguistic communities, uh, you know, um, which have completely different, speaking about 50 different languages, which are completely separate from each other. Some preferring, you know, have completely different expectations and, and standardization of the, of the languages. And in order to understand this and to design fonts, the work started with the research. And the first question, you know, so the work doesn't start like with opening your favorite glyph editor and start designing because there's nothing to open. Uh, you know, there's, it isn't a situation as, you know, work with Latin that you just fill the, the, the positions of, of your slots. You have to understand, you know, like, uh, that first you don't know what to design, and secondly, you don't know how it should look like because, uh, and people think, wait, we can look at Unicode. Yes, there's Unicode. But you need to understand that Unicode is not you know, like information for type designers. It is an important backbone that allows us to standardize and stabilize language and make sure that devices you know, control and render information correctly. But it doesn't provide you contextual information about cultural preferences of different groups. Just like what Jose mentioned, Bulgarian Cyrillic looks different from Russian Cyrillic. Uh, and that information is not contained within Unicode. You need to understand this. It's an additional level which needs to be built on. And the same kind of level of information of cultural preferences happens in most of writing scripts. So usually the shapes which are there indicate certain preferences of certain groups. And again, we don't design fonts for Unicode, we design them for people. And that's why the only way to do it, you have to speak to people. Uh, and for example, if we even went to Unicode and design the full set which was present, we would end up with this kind of text uh, with missing glyphs. And explain why. Um, but before I'll, uh, Kevin prepared a few slides to explain the, um, how syllabics work, which gives me time to drink some water. 
rotation is one of the principles of construction of syllabic characters, which where contrast is not uh, is rotated along with the glyph, so it's not using what we would do normally, like having fixed contrast of the pen. Uh, very different logic of construction shapes. There are these small glyphs, which appear to be like a superscript glyphs, uh, which, are you, which are called the finals. You will see them in, in many of the words. And there are different preferences. Uh, I think I'll show more examples of you know, different regions using different solutions uh, within the typesetting. So designer needs to understand also, uh, you know, for example, like how to terminate a sentence. You know, there are different local traditions. So yes, there is a, something called by linguists uh, United Canadian Aboriginal Calab Syllabics, which is a very diverse, big group of, uh, you know, a, a very big encoding, uh, which covers many different traditions and many different languages. Uh, and it accur accurately renders just about three out of the 50 languages of, of, of Canadian syllabics. Uh, for, for many of the small languages, the representation is not accurate. Uh, and again, because this is basically like if you would group the Cyrillic, Greek, Armenian, Georgian, and, and Latin all into one. Uh, you know, your Armenian may need to have different proportions. What do you do when you know, it's forced to put into the into same group? So they graphically look very distinct. You will see that there are the different languages which uh, use the syllabic principles. So they are phonetically, and they're using the, these clusters of syllabus. Um, they behave differently, they sound different, they, they are different languages. Uh, within them, there are different traditions. So even if you were going to design it, for example, there are two different forms of, uh, of preferences of the round forms and square forms. These are encoded onto the same Unicode po code points. Uh, I need to know like, uh, that those which are in the east of the country and used in the western country, they have different preferences, have to do with the origins, ones were introduced by the English missionaries, the other were the French missionaries, uh, and be codified, and this is again what people uh, prefer. So you need to understand who you're creating the fonts for to make the you know, right decisions about how the shape should look like, because no, both of the shapes are correct, except you know, they're preferred in different places. So this would be the same word, and you see, you know, in, in the Western or uh, well, in the round and square form. What Kevin has made, um, and I mean, there's plenty of information online. I'm not going to, I will not have time to present all information in detail. Uh, so if, if you're interested, there are essays and articles about the use of syllabics. But he would identify there are four main groups of languages. Uh, and um, they have different, and again, distinct orthographic behaviors and typographic requirements for, from which are distinct from each other. A work like this starts in libraries. So you, you look, Kevin would consult books. And luckily, in case of, you know, because Canada is a wealthy country, there, are, there is literature about it. Uh, there are some historical books which can be consulted, but the key element would be probably you know, looking and speaking to communities to understand again how they write and how they speak today. Uh, so I think the big part which I want to kind of emphasize was the community engagement, working with the people, uh, because only then you create kind of usable tools because it is meant for those people. Some. More information, uh, um, syllabics um, had to be, you know, we had to modify also the, the Latin fonts in order to match it with uh, a syllabic. So, you know, the diff there are diff obviously different heights of uh, vertical metrics that the syllabics use, which would require that we need to design a new set of numerals, a completely dis different set of diacritics. But even simple things, for example, like this, because syllabics are very open shapes, they require that the space is very different than, you know, than the normal space in the fonts, uh, which, is not, which is quite a tricky thing to implement correctly you know, if you have a multilingual setting, because space is a neutral character, which is not script specific, it is shared. Uh, you know, making sure that it triggers in the right context is actually very complicated. Uh, so we would have to do plenty of technical work also uh, to make it happen. Uh, but the important work you know, in, uh, across the work was when Kevin found out that um, there would be actually 
a number of sounds for, um, because syllabics are phonetic languages which are not which are missing from syllabics. This is an example of the first uh, Roman syllabics orthography proposed in the 1970s. Uh, we, they were developed by the Inuit Cultural Institute, uh, but somehow they overlooked the unique requirements of uh, Natalingutut, which is the, you know, one of the dialects, one of the small languages completely in the not most northern province of Canada. That's the, this one, you know, marked in blue. Uh, and after finding out about the missing, you know, 12 different sounds, uh, the first thing that Kevin did was try to find a way to speak to the community. So he would reach out to uh, the Pirovik uh, Language Center in Nunavut and, and be put in contact with what they call the language keepers, people who are engaged with languages. And I'm so excited that eventually, at the end of this presentation, we'll be joined live with Tamalik, who was central to these efforts, who's been, uh, we were able to speak to Nilawak, uh, who uh, will not be here, she doesn't speak English. Many of the people who use these languages, uh, they never spoke in English and they, uh, so. And, uh, and other people who made the tremendous progress and a lot of work on standardization of, of these languages, Atima Ilapi Hadlari, who were central to developing the keyboard layouts. Um, and Nilawak, one of the community elders, she proposed these, graph these graphemes uh, for the missing symbols. So that's not the work that we would develop or invent. You know, this is just recognized that you know, like in order to represent their uh, phonetic structure, their, their names, uh, they need these new characters. So we've worked with them to design them and then to create proposals for Unicode to standardize them. So, uh, you know, in order for us to create fonts, but also that others can create also fonts which render these languages correctly. Um, so don't expect that you know, like, uh, everything which is out there, just because it works for your language, it works for everything else. There's plenty of gaps in Unicode which needs to be filled. So it is an open knowledge which needs to grow and needs to, uh, needs to be, you know, it is also a community project. Um, so um, this, there's an extension of Unicode uh, where you know, we added these, these characters, uh, the 12 characters. Uh, it is a process, you know, like, uh, again, I could talk about it forever. Uh, you know, it took about a year and a half to, from the proposal until imp implementation. Uh, but eventually, you know, we were able to produce fonts which would do justice to these smaller languages. Um, once you start doing a project like this, uh, you just keep finding out more information. You know, the, the work doesn't end with production of fonts. You keep, being, keep finding out other, th other things of you know, what is missing, what is not correctly rendered. And one thing which, which we found out and which Kevin identified also during the process was uh, were, um, looking at the reference characters which were used for the carrier language. Carrier languages are used in a different part of Canada, in the British Columbia. Uh, which is, you know, it's a completely different uh, area where the representative glyphs, uh, as they've been proposed, were not really correct. Um, and we were, again, lucky to be able to speak to the community uh, language keepers, and we'll be joined by Francois Prince uh, today, uh, who helped us to revise, to, to look at the, the history of, uh, you know, how these Unicode proposals happened and how we can revise them to render these graphic you know, shapes in a, sh in a way how they're expected by community. So uh, these are, you know, like, uh, some of the first proposals which were, you know, for standardization of syllabics. Uh, we go went through them, we went through the books, uh, speaking to the communities, and finally able to revise them. So all the characters marked in pink were basically changed uh, and modified in order to create a better reference in Unicode, which I think the work then benefits the whole community and doesn't create just our better work, but it create, allows everyone else to create something that the community would expect. Ultimately, it was also a design project, so it was not only about technology, about encoding, about standardization, there are also design challenges. Uh, and one of the challenges was creating a secondary style for syllabics, which there were you know, none or few. But as any writing scripts, you know, like a syllabic is also handwritten. 
so, um, and, and having a secondary script, we understood, would be actually beneficial for creating you know, more complex hierarchies of languages. So uh, people are very excited about ability or chance to use also more scripts, not just weights, but also secondary scripts. So again, it starts with uh, understanding how writing works, uh, how people write, uh, speaking with them, validating a uh, very slow, long process. Uh, but eventually, this is design of uh, uh, you know, a secondary script. Uh, this is lava syllabics. And you see they're graphically distinct. Uh, and people there found it very beautiful to use. So that's, that's very nice. Um, The, the initial phase of the project is complete. Uh, you know, Kevin, uh, we launched the project in February, and uh, this was a tweet that uh, Kevin sent to thank the people involved in the pro process. And you will see that you know, although we did our work correctly, like uh, on Twitter, it still doesn't work. You know, there's still plenty of work to be, to, to be resolved. Uh, so again, it's just the beginning. So it's not, it's not completely ending. Um, so the names of people were not, could not be even rendered correctly uh, because it's a longer process. And these are some of the slides we, uh, Kevin be, had been using in explaining what else needs to be done. So not just studying, creating kind of documentation, uh, creating fonts, but also creating everything else in the tool chain to make sure that the fonts render correctly. And currently, we're working also on uh, Rome, you know, uh, supporting Roman orthographies, which is the same. It sounds much simpler, but it's the same challenge because uh, uh, you know, not all information which is publicly available is correct. So it needs revision, needs understanding. Uh, but it is a slow process that we're going through. Um, so yes, ultimately, we're able to produce fonts, uh, which, again, they we you know, it, with the help of the community. And we're blessed that, you know, the community was very supportive of this, uh, that we're able to look at them, uh, receive feedback. Uh, we could, we, uh, we had to look for ways how to present it because uh, during the process, this, you know, there, it was not yet supported by Unicode. So we had to kind of just create the mockups uh, of testing, you know, how it wor works for different languages, how people can input information when they could not use really keyboard. Um, but eventually, the projects, uh, the fonts are there. So there's a whole selection of fonts. Uh, I now these are some of the samples, uh, which are you know like just simulations and mockups. But uh, what is really exciting is like uh, now seeing these uh, fonts in use, because they are some of the probably the only fonts which work. But I'm hoping that there will be many more. Uh, Notos being updated, uh, or probably is, uh, you know, to match that character set. And uh, hopefully soon I could share real examples of phone books uh, in Nunavut or you know, books and signage, which is using these set of fonts. This is the first end of the first part of the presentation. Um, Again, I was trying to compress it into this introduction. If you want more information, you'll find plenty more on, online. But uh, I'm excited. And again, I wish I didn't have to be here. I wish the other people could be here. Um, but I'd like to invite, if it works, oh yeah, it does work, Kevin, Kevin King, who's been working on, uh, on the phones and d d conducting the, most of the research. Tamalik joining us. Uh, I don't know, where should I look? Should I look there? <laughs> there? <laughs> okay. Uh, Tamalik and Francois Prince uh, from the west of Canada. Uh, people are instrumental for this process, uh, and without them, with, you know, without them, we would not be able to do any of this. Uh, so I guess I'll look forward. Um, I'll hopefully, don't see my back. Um, and wanted to. I mean, I have questions for all of you, um, and I'll probably start with Kevin because. Uh, I wondered how do you how do you um, how do you, can you describe the pro the process or the approach of reaching out to Tamalik and and uh, and Guy and uh, because I know there's a lot of discussion about um, you know you as a Canadian you considered settler but still reaching out to the First Nation communities uh, what is the process of showing respect of of finding out more about languages which are used there. Can you describe, you know, like uh, the methods or like the, the, the dialogue that you're having? Okay. How are the sounds? Wait. 
Wait, wait, wait. I think we have some sound issue. Just a second. So, um, just in case, when I look back, and I want to see your faces, so that's why I'm not turning back. Okay, so I'll probably look in there. Kevin apparently is a problem on your, your end. So maybe we'll wait for this resolve and I'll ask then Tamalik and Guy about, can you talk about the technical barriers that you've been facing before? So let's talk about information before, like what happened, what kind of, how do you work with text in situation where it's not properly supported? Either of you. Yeah, one of the things that uh, we had trouble with was trying to find the original script, uh, trying to follow the original script of what was created. And, you know, from since 1885, when they were first made, one of the uh, things that it was really hard to get passed down. Um, a lot of the First Nations that knew the writing system uh, never passed it down to the children, namely because of the language, um, uh, the, the struggle with the language um, because of the colonization and residential school. Uh, so the syllabics kind of faded out. However, um, there was some people, namely my dad, who actually was teaching and, and kept that going. And so I was able to pick that up. Um, however, um, the new technology that came into play um, uh, made it very difficult because of how the languages were structured and re being revitalized. So. So uh, the syllabics kind of was put on the uh, sidelines um, with all the linguistics. All right. Um, Tamalik, um, can you tell us why the syllabics are so important? What does it mean for you to use syllabics? Because there are some languages which use Latin orthography. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the um, the elders in the area that syllabics is used in uh, Inuit Nunangat, which is uh, you know the areas of Inuit lands, um, they, they embraced uh, the syllabics right away um, since the in since the 1900s and when they were introduced and they were passed by generation uh, by Inuit. Uh, from generation to generation, they, they were very well embraced, um, very um, uh, they, they worked well with the uh, oral language, the oral culture, it's completely f designed phonetically. Um, and um, the uh, um, I like your word uh, graphic autonomy because that's very much what syllabics users uh, among Inuit uh, that love syllabics. That's um, certainly uh, Roman is coming up behind because of all the years and years of uh, technical difficulties with syllabics. But um, your presentation here was fantastic. It just covered so much of uh, the history that's uh, not been heard. It's very unique that it's all in one place. And uh, the, um, it's important because it's important to the people. And uh, in Nakchiling Mir case, uh, I grew, I'm, uh, my parents are not indigenous, they're not Inuit, but I grew up as a child uh, taught by the community, the syllabics and the language, and I'm a language advocate, um, and I write curriculum 
and this is, uh, you know, there's many years of uh, loss that rep are represented by just not having the, um, as technology grew really fast, uh, syllabics was slow behind and the kids pick up what they see, you know, they see apps and <laughs> all the stuff that, you know, it, it, it speaks very loud that their language isn't important. And it is, it's important to the people. Excellent. Kevin, is your sound working? Yeah, Hello? we still don't hear you. Okay. Hello? No, uh, we, we hear everyone but Kevin. So I'm just trying to work out. Still, still not. If okay. Perfect working. Now I don't know what happened. Yeah. Ah, okay. Excellent. Oh. Great. <laughs> okay. Uh, you can hear me now? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. great. Okay. Hello, everybody. <laughs> yeah, can you tell us about the outreach and you're working with the community? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, first of all, thank you for the presentation, Peter. And uh, Francois and Tamalik, thank you so much for sharing uh, the importance of what the syllabics means to the community and the work, the very important work that you're doing. For myself, from my perspective as a typeface designer, and when I began the project, I knew that in order to do a project like this correctly, I had to engage in a process of community outreach. And what I needed to, what I did, uh, decided that I needed to do first was I needed to learn how to do this and how to do this kind of research. So I spent actually quite a bit of time at the beginning learning from different university departments in Canada that have um, resources around how a settler person like myself uh, can engage with um, indigenous communities in a way that is respectful. Um, because something that I have to be sensitive about, as Peter mentioned, is the dynamic that I'm a settler person, born in Canada, but raised in, from a European worldview perspective. Whereas indigenous, the, the worldview of indigenous peoples is quite different. And that's something that I had to, um, to learn about understanding how to navigate that, um, uh, to navigate that, uh, the building of a relationship and the building and maintenance of trust. Um, so I learned about things like what is a respectful and appropriate way to engage in the process of knowledge exchange and sharing, um, understanding issues like indigenous ownership. So after I could do that, I think the most important thing that I needed to bring to the table as a designer and a researcher coming in was being a very good listener making sure to take the to work to be a good listener as well and listen to what um, language keepers such as Tamalik and Francois were sharing with me, which were the issues as the community experienced them. Because of course, in my investigations, I understood the Unicode issues that Peter mentioned. Those can be identified um, in some respects from looking at the document, the technical documentation. But in order to understand, uh, and Peter made a great point, we make fonts for people, not for Unicode, and that's absolutely true. So I needed to come in and be a good listener to understand exactly how the community was experiencing the problems and the barriers that all this presented. So that, and, the, and this process of building trust, it's a continual process. I'm always working and learning and adapting to improve this, but this was key to my approach. Okay, thank you. And Francois, I mean, uh, I hope you understand that it's a completely different community. And Francois is in, the, in British Columbia where th there's a lot, much less use of the syllabics. So what does the use of syllabics in British Columbia means to your language community? You, the, the beautiful thing about the syllabics that I found right away was uh, that that doesn't exist in actually the um, the the, the modern teaching dynamic is is that our spirit of the language is in every sound and every every symbol is represented by a sound and the sound is actually refers to something in our language um, and 
that's where the spirit of our language is. And that's why there's, um, um, there's a, a lot of conflict now when people are writing the language or the, making the dictionaries, they're translating a word, one word into um, one meaning. Whereas, depending on how you use the sounds or the words, it changes the reference. So there could be up to 10 different real translations or use of the word or the symbol, um, depending on how you use it. Even uh, the symbol for like nay. Nay, if it's in the beginning of the word, it refers to us. If it's at the end of the word, it refers to people. So it's it's very interesting how this um, how the spirit of the language is in every sound of the symbol, and it's a beautiful thing because when a person understands that they make every sound, when I when I get people to make every sound of the syllabic sound, they actually make every sound in our language, and they're like, oh my goodness, maybe my language isn't that far away. So it really, it really brings it down to earth, and it brings it, bring, puts the spirit back into our language, and it, uh, it makes it more attainable. Excellent, Tamalik, uh, you work as a translator as well. What are the mm -hmm. challenges of you working, you know, with spoken and then written <laughs> communication? Hmm. Well, the written uh, piece has been highly limited. Uh, what Francois just said uh, was um, very resonant. The, uh, the sounds of the language is the spirit of the language. And we had, as uh, Kevin mentioned in his presentation, and you've mentioned, a number of sounds that were missing, missing in Nachiling YouTube. So um, it 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 was uh, it was impossible to type basically uh, with the full sounds, or we would use characters that were not that. So it was an either or. Uh, for example, ye, there's a yi yu ya, and in in um, in the ICI standard, they said, well, you know, if you say ri ru ra, you can use the yi yu ya. Uh, symbol, but uh, thinking that it was either or, that some dialects just say ri ru ra instead of yi yu ya sound, but no, Nachiling Mewtwo had both, so there was no way to distinguish. So you had to be fluent to read Nachiling Mewtwo, because you wouldn't know what was written. So distinguishing the sounds and sound and spirit, it, it's so beautifully um, expressed. Uh, the, you really expressed that perfectly for what what we um, what what I go through. <laughs> the, I could write it in Roman, uh, uh, different things, but it's I've been held back in writing much Nechiling Mewtwo until uh, Kevin came along, and uh, by the time we we had a um, there was a huge uh, manuscript to do, like 200 words or 200 pages <laughs> it was a lot. And um, that, that was the birth of Nachiling um, Mute uh, characters going into Unicode coincided with this. I copied and pasted every single instance where things were missing using a custom font. And then I had support uh, through uh, Kevin and Peter's company. They translated all of the custom uh, font because it couldn't be read in Noto Aboriginal, for example. It couldn't be read in Unicode, so they had to like line up it all into Unicode. And now it's it's readable like right on the internet. It's amazing, like really big difference. I'm uh, t <laughs> talking about the solutions as well. You asked about the barriers, but the barriers. Uh, it took two and a half years to do 200 pages. Uh, it was so tedious, but Nilao Lak, the elder that designed the characters, like tweaked the characters that existed to to have the sounds in the dialect. She said it has to be in our, you know, custom font. I said okay, <laughs> I'm doing it, and and, and uh, my Apple computer wouldn't work. Uh, I spoke to everybody, 
uh, about it. The custom de font developer, the um, distributor, every no, nobody could figure out why it wouldn't work on my computer. <laughs> so time was wasted, and I was copying and pasting. And now I can type. I can just type. It's great. No, I think that great. That's. Uh, I can bridge it to talk about impact because I think more than just talking about, you know, like a, I think Kevin, for example, I don't think we are trying to design just beautiful shapes, but really create impactful solutions. Uh, can you talk about how to achieve this? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that's important because, and it, it comes back to um, just looking at the challenges that uh, Tamalik expressed with this, with the 200 page manuscript and just how much of a, a barrier on the publishing side of preparing a document such as that involved without having reliable, I think that what's important about the Naturalique um, issues that we identified and worked through was that it was not possible to reliably transmit digital text. And that's something that I think that for myself, I take completely for granted because I grew up using English and I use English in my daily life and all of the technical the digital text infrastructure is is completely set up for that so i can i can pick up any device and use it but something that was really profound to me when i started even just investigating the problems was the fact that the natural league community couldn't do that um francois the dacath community also could not reliably write syllabics in digital text either because it was not an accurate representation. Um, and so what these, I think that the, these pose barriers to just everyday use of the, of the language across these digital platforms that are so vital to us today. So for me, um, I think what, what we're hoping that our tools are able to do is not just deliver nice typographic solutions and expanding the typographic palette but it's also laying a foundation for future syllabics fonts to come, meaning that there will be the means of reliable transmission of text now that we've settled things at the standards level. And I think that one thing I want to say quickly too, uh, Peter mentioned this and Jose mentioned this, uh, you mentioned this in your talk uh, right before Peter, the fact that fonts are not just font designer gets their name put on a font so peter and i are talking to you today but there are so many other people as well that were essential to making this happen so for instance lang hai i wouldn't have been able to navigate the proposal process either of them at all or building the fonts to make them work the script ad hoc committee through unicode who you may or may not be familiar with but they're so they're a group of experts that are so essential to helping review drafts of proposals to ensure that they will get accepted eventually in Unicode. So for me, my goal is that the fonts, through the process of not only working together with um, language keepers like uh, Tamalik and Francois um, to solve these technical problems, we can give them this uh, basis, but also Tamalik and Francois, as well as Dennis, um, and uh, Nelalak and Elizabeth and Atima Hedleri, they also tested the fonts throughout the whole process as well. And we continue now to identify, for instance, local typographic preferences and Natchelik syllabics that we're, we're working with the community still to, to improve the fonts further. Um, we're working with uh, Francois and Dennis to develop a more reliable Unicode compliant syllabics keyboard for Carrier or Dacath language. So just things like this, like the work began and we shared with you what we've done, but the work continues. Um, so the impact, we've laid a foundation and now we continue to, to try to, we try to continue that impact forward with doing this work that we, we still have to do together. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I think we're running out of time, but I want to. I don't know if anyone has a question before we wrap up. Oh, no, there are actually some questions. So. Oh, that's great. So uh, I hope I'm going to be clear enough. It's more of an engineering question. So you were talking about the regional preferences and the keyboard layout, and all of this is kind of supposed to be supported by localized dictionaries. Uh, 
by the OS, and so I was wondering if you have some kind of collaboration with Apple and Microsoft to implement it more. Like, so the font is not doing the job of the of the browser support, of the OS support in terms of dictionaries. Right. Maybe I can answer it very quickly. Um, correct. You know, like any, you know, the problem with global solution is that it's that it lacks context. So usually you either provide a context for how it should work, uh, so some kind of language tag, script tag, you know, or you need to kind of split it up so it doesn't. It's no longer a global font, but we create specific font, for example, for carrier, uh, and we have to split that you know large work of syllabics into many different uh, subset of the fonts to make sure that it works which is a lot more reliable because usually uh, you know these global solutions they're not technically reliable enough for to, right now uh, mm -hmm. it is work to be done so yeah Hey, thank you for your presentation. I have more financial question. So as Jose mentioned before, um, projects like this doesn't start because of financial outcome or at least are not profitable in a way. So, and yet you have so many people collaborating and hours and years probably working on this project. So I'm wondering, was this project founded or what was financial part of this? Um, yeah, there is no external funding at all. So this is our company de developing them, uh, this work. It is funded by our other work. Uh, so that's the only funding. And uh, it is investment for the future. It is investment for local communities. And we believe that even you know, supporting small language as well makes our other work much better, much more reliable. So, um, but there's no funding from any other source. Kudos on that. <laughs> yes. Okay.